Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if I can now have your attention, please. We are ready to resume. I want to say uh, welcome back. I hope that you had uh, a good break. I hope that you had a chance to look at the trade show. We have 220 vendors participating this year, and I hope that you've had a chance to find some things that are of particular interest to your municipality. This morning we have the privilege of having the Premier here with us, and it brings back memories of a year ago at the SUMA convention. I believe it was four days after the Premier was sworn in as Premier, he came to the SUMA convention in Regina. And that impressed me greatly. Four days after taking office, he was prepared to come and speak to us. And I think that tells you how important or how important he thinks we are, uh, how important we are to the whole functioning of this province. Our board of members are 439 member municipalities. We are representing 80% of the population of Saskatchewan. And so this is very important for us to be able to have the Premier come and address us. It's very important as well to see that he shares the value in relationship between the government of Saskatchewan and SUMA. And we are looking forward to the return of Cabinet on Wednesday for the Bear Pit session. Thank you for also the consultations that we've had throughout the year. And I haven't seen Minister Keating here but yet, but uh, uh, Minister Keating, uh, there he is, uh, has been excellent as well, Premier, in terms of consultations with us, with us throughout the year. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to the Premier of Saskatchewan, Scott Moe. Well, thank you very much, Gordon, and, uh, and welcome, everyone. Welcome to the SUMA executive, uh, SUMA staff, delegates, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen from across the province. Good morning. Good morning on a, uh, a brisk winter day in Saskatoon. As Gordon said, uh, four days after um, I was uh, sworn in as Premier last year, I had the opportunity to address uh, this, the SUMA delegates, and, and it's a great honour for me to have uh, that opportunity again this year. I want to acknowledge, uh, we do have a, a couple of MPs, federal MPs in the crowd here today and I want to acknowledge them and I want to acknowledge my legislative colleagues that are here today. I see a couple table, tablefuls full of them up at the front. Um, I have the opportunity as uh, your leader of this province to work with what I believe to be the strongest caucus in the nation. I work with uh, your representatives. Uh, they are a very, very strong at representing your views in our caucus and they are, as I said, the strongest team in the nation and I'm very proud to show up and work with them each and every day. So thank you to my colleagues for what you bring to the table uh, each and every day beha on behalf of the communities in this room. We're looking forward to a good discussion uh, here this morning and over the next couple of days as I'm sure you, on, and as, as I'm sure you are and as uh, Gordon said, um, Cabinet will be back for the Bear Pit on Wednesday which is Always a lot of fun, at least for some of you in the room. <laughs> but most certainly, I, I would say this on behalf of my, my colleagues, uh, the Bear Pit Session um, is a great opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for us to, to uh, hear directly from main streets right across, in communities right across this province. It's a great uh, opportunity for us to hear that unfiltered message and to continue uh, with the strong relationship and the partnership that we have. And ladies and gentlemen, we do have a strong partnership, as Gordon mentioned. A partnership that is grounded in, in a common commitment to serving the people of, of Saskatchewan. A partnership that is informed by, by shared experiences. And in our caucus, we have former mayors. We have a former deputy mayor. We have, we have many former, former councillors, such as Erica Lawson and Gordon Wyant. We, have, uh, we had the late Kevin Phillips who served very capably as the mayor of Melfort and later went on to serve as the member of the Legislative Assembly for that community. We have our Health Minister, Jim Ryder, who, who was a municipal administrator for many years. And Jim, is, Jim was, uh, he was excellent at his job. He tells me that all the time. <laughs> and I think Don Morgan has also requested in caucus that we address him as uh, his worship, even though he has never served as a mayor anywhere, not even in his own home. 
But the point I, I am making is uh, that within our government, there is an understanding of the issues that, that you are dealing with in, in, your, in your council chambers. And there's a deep appreciation of the time and the energy, energy that you commit to serving your communities with, without often much fanfare and without often much acclaim. So it's only appropriate to take a minute to say how thankful we are for your steadfast and effective leadership in this province. And that often isn't just dealing with routine matters that may come to your table or contentious issues that, that come your way, but we're also grateful for the inspirational leadership that you provide in, in times of trouble or times of, of challenge. You know, during natural disasters that I can think uh, just a few years ago, Due to natural or during uh, times of natural disasters, due to extreme weather, you've been on the front lines dealing with the immediate impact to to the citizens that you serve and we serve. And, and last March, in the aftermath of what was the most horrible accident involving our humble Broncos, we saw inspirational leadership once again. We saw Rare Mayor uh, Rob Munch, his fellow councillors, and the staff at the City of Humboldt. They stood so very tall during during this terrible crisis. They were humbled strong in, in every respect. And they were supported by the people in this room, as well as colleagues from across the province and, uh, and across the country. And so today, to all of those involved, I want to acknowledge your leadership, I want to acknowledge your service, and I want to convey the heartfelt gratitude of the entire province. Thank you so very much. Folks, this morning, I plan to update you on where things stand in, in our province of Saskatchewan from, from our perspective of, of the provincial government. I want to offer some insight on what you might expect to see in the days ahead, and that includes what you may see in the upcoming provincial budget this spring. It's hard to believe, but as Gordon said, it was just a year ago at this convention that I made my first major speech as a, as a new premier. And I said then that Traveling through the province during the months that led up to that has reaffirmed my faith in, in the strength of, of Saskatchewan communities and, and in, in the strength of Saskatchewan people. And a year on this job has only deepened my conviction that we are truly blessed to call this province, to call Saskatchewan our home. Today there are so many reasons for us to be, to be optimistic about the future of this province. Beginning with our population which continues to grow, even during what is sometimes considered challenging times. Right now, there are more than 1,165,000 people in this province, a record. Our population has grown for 50 consecutive quarters. This is the longest sustained period of growth since they started keeping records in 1971. You in this room are part of this. And it's incumbent on each of us, it's incumbent on all of us serving at every level of government to ensure that our province continues to move forward, continues to progress, and continues to grow to provide opportunity for everyone. People are coming to this province today because there is opportunity in our Saskatchewan communities. Opportunities for a career in your community. Opportunities for people to build a life right here with their family, possibly in the community where they were raised. Our economy has proven resilient despite some challenging times. We've come through what we hope is the worst of the downturn that was caused in many ways by a, by a steep drop off in natural resource prices. And while we still face some significant challenges, some economic challenges and some major headwinds, and I'll speak about those in a moment, there are some encouraging signs. For instance, we've added 11,000 jobs in the most recent Stats Can report. Most of those are full-time jobs. We've seen strong manufacturing and wholesale trade numbers. For the first 11 months of 2018, our exports were up 11% over 2017, up 11% over the year previous. These are exports that are the source of wealth in our communities. Agricultural exports are still near historical highs, despite 
a tough growing season and even tougher time getting that crop off despite some ongoing trade difficulties that we may have. Here's another reason for us to be optimistic. In Saskatoon and elsewhere in this province, there are young, ambitious, energetic entrepreneurs that are doing quite literally amazing things. They're busy building the economy of the future, the economy that will drive the growth of this province for quite likely the next 50 years and beyond. And you may have seen the recent media coverage of a company called Seven Shifts, based right here in Saskatoon. Seven Shifts makes employee scheduling software for restaurants, software that is now being used in, in over 10,000 restaurants all around the world. Seven Shifts just raised another $13.3 million. The company employs 80 people and expects to hire another 40 this year. And that's just one company among so very many that are leading our, our province. Saskatoon is the second fastest growing tech hub in the countryside outside of the Waterloo area. Second fastest growing in the nation. And our government is supporting this sector through initiatives like Colabs, the province's first technology incubator right here in Saskatoon, and the Saskatchewan Technology Startup Incentive. This is the latest chapter in an innovation story that began so many decades ago. We all know that our province has been a world leader in the development and the production of, of agricultural machinery. Companies like Honeybee, like Morris, Depker Industries, Seedhawk, Schulte, all global players in their own right, headquartered for the most, most part right here in small town Saskatchewan. We're world leaders when it comes to crop science and ag biotech. We're world leaders in clean energy research. And our food processing industry is coming on very strong. Today, Saskatchewan's economy is more diversified than ever because of our capacity to innovate. And we have momentum on our side thanks to the growth that we've experienced over the course of the past decade. Growth that has allowed our government to make record investments in your community, record investments in highways, in health care, in education, in infrastructure, both provincial and municipal, and in municipal revenue sharing, which would be of no interest to anyone in this room, <laughs> especially your president. Ladies and gentlemen, revenue sharing has grown significantly over the course of the past decade. In fact, since 2007, it's up 89%. That's for the province as a whole, 89%. But many communities have seen the revenue sharing more than double since 2007, and that is due to the population growth that we've been experiencing. For example, in Saskatoon, it's up 144%. Swift Current is up 123%, and Melford is up 131%, a good story in itself. There is no other sector in Saskatchewan that has seen provincial funding in, a provincial funding increase at this rate over this period of time. Last year, four days after I was sworn in as Premier, we had that comfortable discussion about freezing revenue sharing at $241 million while we worked with you as a partner to revise the formula. The changes that we had announced in the year previous to the PST in 2017 meant the formula had to, be, had to be redeveloped. It had to be modified. We had a formula that was predictable and transparent, and those were words that we talked about over the years of the implementation of the original revenue sharing formula. These were the fundamental qualities that all parties involved in the discussion wanted to preserve, wanted so dearly to preserve, and today I'm pleased to announce that the new revenue sharing formula for the province of Saskatchewan, a revenue sharing formula that retains those crucial qualities of predictability and transparency, transparency, and it will be sustainable into the future. Under the new formula, revenue sharing will be based on a value of three quarters of one percent, three quarters of one point, pardon me, of the PST. That's 75 percent of one point of the PST. This means with the changes that were made, in the coming fiscal year, revenue sharing will rise by $10 million to $251 million next year. That's about a 4% increase. <laughs> a 
And you are well represented at those discussion tables at our caucus table by your MLA. But that is about a 4% increase. Municipalities will continue to have the ability to use revenue sharing to address the priorities as you see fit. And I want to thank you. I want to thank each of you and through you to your councils for your patience as we work to adapt this revenue sharing, for, uh, this revenue sharing formula to these new circumstances. And I think it's fair to say that the fact that we were able to sit down and reconfigure this formula that had worked so well without getting bogged down in acrimony speaks to the strength of the partnership between the provincial government and SUMA and SARM. Both parties wanted certainty and that's what we have moving forward today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm also announcing this morning that the provincial budget will be released on March the 20th. And it will be a balanced budget. In 2017, we put forward a three-year plan to reduce our dependency on resource revenue and to balance our provincial budget. Well, this spring is that third year. That plan to balance remains on track and we'll be introducing that balanced budget this spring to reach those goals. We did have to make some, some very challenging decisions. We had to control our spending. We had to control our investment. And that effort continues into this budget year. This budget will also, as I said, see municipalities get a 4.4% lift in their revenue sharing formula. Many organizations are not going to see a similar boost in their funding from the province this year. Make no mistake, this will be another tight budget. We need to be disciplined. We need to ensure that we have the fiscal capacity to provide the services and programs that the people of Saskatchewan value, the services and programs that we have been able to experience over the course of the last number of years so that we can have those programs and services not just today, not just tomorrow, but so we can still have those services in our, for our children's generation. Deficits erode that capacity, deficits erode that opportunity over time, and that's why we need to balance the budget, and the sooner we do it, the better, and it's going to happen this spring. The budget will provide more detail as well on our infrastructure investment. As you know, we signed on to the federal government's tripartite investing in Canada program recently. There will be four envelopes that will be available for municipal projects and provincial projects. The first will be our urban public transit envelope. The second will be a green infrastructure envelope. The third will be the community culture and recreation infrastructure. And the last, the fourth envelope will be the rural and northern communities envelope. We look forward to working with, with your councils across this province on the initiatives, the important infrastructure initiatives in the coming months as infrastructure remains a key priority for all of us. We've invested since 2008 12 and a half billion dollars in, in it, just in executive government. That includes a 1.6 billion dollar investment in, uh, in municipal infrastructure. Whether it's roads, sewer, water, water treatment plants, recreational centers, whether it's bridges, schools, or hospitals, our government has made major commitments in infrastructure in your community often in partnership with you. A commitment that includes investment like the, like the Jim Patterson Children's Hospital opening later this year right here in Saskatoon. A provincial hospital in every aspect. The state-of-the-art Children's Hospital is finally in our province. A hospital that will serve a hub of, a hub of clinical best practices and learning for professionals. A, ho a, a hospital that will truly serve families of Saskatchewan families that we want to recruit and retain into our province. A hospital that will help us recruit and retain the very best pediatric and maternal health care specialists in the nation. Our commitment to infrastructure includes the Regina Bypass, soon to be completed on time and on budget, the largest infrastructure project in provincial history. A project that will ensure safer access in and out of our province's capital city by, yes, transport trucks, but also by vehicles carrying our families. Safer access. We have a new Saskatchewan hospital in North Battleford that will be opening this spring. We have a new hospital in Moose Jaw. We have long-term care facilities across this province. We have new arenas and recreational centers across this province. 
and our crown corporations continue to invest, continue to invest in a rural cellular and data outbuild. $16.5 billion have been invested over the last 11 years to ensure that our power and our communications are solid. Ladies and gentlemen, we continue to invest to this extent because Saskatchewan, we believe, has every opportunity to continue to, gr to grow. The potential of our communities, our people, and our province is enormous. I mentioned our entrepreneurs earlier, our incredible capacity to innovate in our industries. You know about the resources that we have in this province, potash, uranium, oil, timber, in quantities that, that inspire everyone all around the world. You're aware of our, our agricultural producers and our urban agricultural industry, our ag research, re researchers right here in Saskatoon or in Melfort, our ag equipment technicians in your communities across the province, our professional agronomists, our manufacturing employees. These people are the very best at what they do. Saskatchewan is quite literally feeding the world. But I also said the industries that we rely on the industries that are producing very efficiently and very sustainably the food, fuel, and fertilizer for the world, they're facing some headwinds. There are some obstacles in our path as we look forward. The very first of those, obviously, is, is we have lower resource prices than what we've been used to in years gone by. Lower prices that are now starting to show the, the very first signs of strength. But we have some other obstacles. We have a federal government that is placing obstacles in, in the path of the success of these industries. This is the uncomfortable reality that, quite frankly, we are faced with today. My friends, at this time when our economy is recovering, our, our lower natural resources are starting to recover, but yet still fragile, at a time when our energy sector is, is just beginning to get back on its feet, at a time when our, our mining industry is dealing with lower but slowly recovering prices, at a time when our manufacturers are facing uncertainty caused by, by American steel tariffs, the federal government is choosing to impose a carbon tax on the people of Canada. A carbon tax that will destroy jobs, discourage investment, it will inflict higher costs on industry and families, and it will do absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In British Columbia, for example, British Columbia, they have a $35 a ton carbon tax and emissions have went up 4.1% since it was introduced. When I attended this convention a year ago, Saskatchewan was alone in our opposition to this, to this ineffective, harmful tax. But today, in Ontario, in New Brunswick, in Manitoba, and perhaps very shortly in Alberta, there is a growing consensus that this federal tax is destructive, it's ineffective, and it is absolutely unnecessary. In our province, we have our own climate change plan. It's a plan of prairie resilience. It's a plan that will result in actual emissions reductions without harming our economy, our resource-based economy. My friends, we will not back down in our opposition to this federal carbon tax and will be in court uh, shortly asking for our reference opinion. Nor will we relent in our position on Bill C-69, the federal government's No More Pipelines Bill. Bill C-69 creates unnecessary barriers to development of our industries without making any meaningful improvements to the environmental review process. It moves the, re the review process away from something that is, that is science-based and factual to something much more nebulous, if you will, such as the impact on the intersection, inter, intersection of sex, gender, and other identity factors. And if you don't understand quite what that means, no one does. <laughs> the conversation about Bill C-69, make, make no bones about this, the conversation about Bill C-69 has effectively killed energy, the Energy East pipeline the pipeline that takes sustainable Saskatchewan energy to a new refinery that would be built in New Brunswick. 
It's now causing the Trans Mountain Pipeline to die slowly by strangulation. The project, I would add, that you and I in this room now own. What does this mean for our province and communities in our province? Well, it means we don't get world prices for, our, for the oil that we produce. The sustainable energy products that we produce, we do not receive the world price. That's 400,000 barrels a day that we are selling at a discount, most of it to the United States, as we just have one customer for that product. The price differential is costing our energy sector billions of dollars each year. And it's costing your government directly, our government directly, millions of dollars in revenues through taxes and royalties. Revenues, I would add, that could be invested in highways, in hospitals, and in schools, in your communities. And ladies and gentlemen, this isn't Scott Moe's political theater moment. This is about, this is about workers in Estevan wanting to put food on their table. This is about families in Maidstone that need to make a mortgage payment. This is about young people across this province, some yet to come here, wanting to start a life in your community. This is not political theater, this is real life that we're talking about and it's time that the federal government woke up to this fact that oil, that energy, that gas, that manufacturing, that agriculture, these are Saskatchewan industries that create wealth for the people and communities not only in our province, but across the nation. It is absolutely crucial that we advocate strong, loud and proud for the ongoing strength of these industries and the jobs that they provide in our communities and the opportunity that they provide for families to move to our communities. These are the industries that give us the fiscal capacity to support the programs and infrastructure that we expect in our communities. This includes programs supporting the most vulnerable among us. In closing, I want to take you to, I want to take you to the community of Spearwood, just west of where I live. In Spearwood, there's a group home that's run by an incredible organization called Prairie Community Endeavors. I was there when the group home opened in 2012, and what a great day that was. The announcement was part of our government's effort to improve the life for for people living with intellectual disabilities. Since 2007, we've boosted the funding in this area from, from $215 million to $561 million a year, 161% increase, because it's the right thing to do. And we could only do that because our economy was growing. Last April, I had the opportunity to return to Spearwood. We were celebrating the relaunch of the day program at that very group home. There was new washrooms and there was more space for the clients. And the clients really stole the show that day. Greg and, and Shirley and Bradley and Lynn, Alma and Sean. They were pretty happy and they welcomed everyone with open arms. Since then, they've been able to grow their client list. It's expanded to include Ben and, and Samuel and, and Fred. And ladies and gentlemen, it's been said that dignity is essential to human life as water, food, or oxygen. And all of us want, and all of us deserve, to be respected and to be valued. Well, Prairie Community Endeavors has been providing that essential element in the community of Spearwood for more than 20 years now. Dignity. And there are dozens of other organizations that are doing the very same thing in communities right across Saskatchewan. And when you get down to it, that's what it's all about. Being there for the people that need our help. That's why our communities need to continue to advance. That's why our province needs to continue to advance. And that's why our province must continue to grow. And that's why I will never apologize for standing up for Saskatchewan because standing up for Saskatchewan is always the right thing to do. Thank you very much and have a great week at your convention here.